My name is Rakesh Ahuja, and I am a PGY5 integrated IRDR resident at uh, Medical Center in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm currently serving as the Society of Interventional Radiology's resident fellow student section council chair. Uh, SIR RFS, in collaboration with Society of Interventional Radiology, Indian Society of Vascular and Interventional Radiology, and British Society of Interventional Radiology, is very excited to start this series of webinars on peripheral arterial disease, one of the most prevalent diseases worldwide. With this global endeavor, we hope that we can spark your interest in the world of PAD and eventually equip you with knowledge to help patients in your communities. Uh, we have some of the most experienced and enthusiastic international faculty taking charge today. Uh, to lead us through this webinar, we have with us Dr. Parat Patel from Medical College of Wisconsin, USA, and Dr. Sahar Sabri from MedStar uh, Washington Hospital in DC, uh, who will be our moderators. Uh, we have a pretty robust panel of uh, uh, the lectures who will be given by Dr. Keith Pereira, Dr. Joji Watakanchari, Dr. Bella Hausen, Dr. Mike Watts, Dr. Lorenzo Patron, Dr. Vimal Someshwar, Dr. Kumar Madasari, and last but not the least, Dr. Nick Alinalo. With that being said, just a little bit of a housekeeping before we get started. We will be following this agenda uh, and your active participation is very important throughout the session. Right now, we have everyone on the mute to avoid background noises. You can enter your questions and comments in the question box throughout the presentation, and they will be answered by the faculty. Please do not ask questions in the chat box. A recorded version of this webinar will be available at the later date on SIR RFS IR Education YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Dr. Sabri and Dr. Patel to kickstart this boot camp. Let's make Dr. Charles Daughter proud. Thank you, Rocky. Uh, again, I want to welcome all the attendees. Uh, we've had a phenomenal amount of interest in this uh, webinar, over 675 registered, and our attendees coming on live uh, continue to climb. And I think this clearly demonstrates the interest amongst our trainees within the IR uh, community and, and perhaps beyond as this was an open webinar. And I think it also emphasizes our continued need for this type of programming. So I'm very excited to be joined by Dr. Sahar Sabri, my co-moderator. Both of us um, have focused in vascular disease clinically in our careers, but also within leading trainee education for the Society of Interventional Radiology. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sahar, who will yeah, introduce our I, speakers. Thanks, Parag. This is this is a um, an excellent opportunity to advance education for our trainees, and uh, congratulations for the resident fellow section of SIR for putting this together and have a wide audience. Next, I'll introduce um, uh, Keith Pereira. He's gonna from St. Louis. He's gonna speak to us about history and um, current classification for PAD. Keith, take it over. Two. Uh, Dr. Barry should be the presenter now. Yeah, I can't hear you, Keith. We see your screen. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, so the first topic for today is um, history and uh, and classification of PAD. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the history, of course, and uh, you know classification re relevant to uh, to PAD. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Keith Pereira. I'm from St. Louis University. This is my Twitter handle in case you guys want to get in touch with me. So, history of PAD. Uh, and what is his relationship to vascular interventional radiology? And uh, it sort of seems like a chicken and the egg. So let's break it down to you know figure out where are we uh, with respect to PAD. Uh, so when was the first endovascular intervention? Okay, so, and this you know most of us know this story, but for, you know for those trainees who are you know stepping into your training programs, uh, 1964 was was the event. Uh, most of us know 82 year old Laura Shaw who came in. Uh, to see a surgeon with gangrene of her toes uh, 
and her surgeon recommended a below knee amputation. What the surgeon did was also sent it to a radiologist. And I'm saying radiologist because there was no interventional radiology at that time. Uh, sent it to the interventional radiologist for an angiogram, and uh, the interventional radiologist saw the stenosis here in the common in the in the superficial femoral artery. And uh, you know, again, relevant is there was no angioplastic balloons at that time. He put a wire, he put some tubes over it, almost like dilators. And uh, what he saw was uh, improvement, which at this point of time seems like such a given, right? But at that point of time, there was it, it never existed, uh, you know, such such type of stuff. Um, ultimately, what happened and what is more clinically relevant is although the patient had a small amputation of her toes, she uh, went home on still walking on her own feet. Uh, this was this was pretty revolutionary at this time, and uh, you know the 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 man who did all this was uh, Sir Charles' daughter, uh, often referred to as father of interventional radiology, and this actually propelled a lot of things that we are doing right now. Uh, angioplasty, stents, tip, embolization, all actually started with this intervention uh, way back in 1964. So um, I think. This actually marked the birth of vascular interventional radiology in in in, in the in, in the modern world. So, uh, back again to our uh, to our uh, to our chicken and egg theory. Uh, I thought I I like this GIF a lot. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, I played for you again. Uh, this is a still image. It's pretty shocked to see what actually happened. Uh, and so, accidentally awesome or not, uh, we can safely say that PAD marks the humble beginning of vascular interventional radiology. Um, so really, it's 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 been it's been a core for all these years. So back to history. I'm not going to get in details, but what happened after that? So 1964. This is what happened. This is you know a case that I'm going to show from 2020. This is uh, probably a week ago. Uh, you know, Charles' daughter did uh, an intervention uh, in the femoral artery, and now we are doing more and more stuff uh, below the knee, and 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 complex stuff like this. Uh, and then I'll show you. Uh, so. You know, if we're doing pedal access, right? We're going getting the pedal arteries in the in the foot now, anterior tibial artery in the foot, posterior tibial artery in the foot. We're getting pedal access, climbing our way up with wires and catheters. It's called flossing and crossing. Okay. We're also reconstructing pedal loops. This is an, an X-ray of the foot where there is a wire right going right across and performing pedal loop reconstruction. This is a complex popliteal trifurcation in, uh, uh, intervention where you put uh, a stent from from the top and uh, you know put kissing stents from below to to open up the artery. So this is complex, and this is uh, why I'm showing you this case is because this is done by uh, by uh, by this by this physician. Who's this physician? You know we have Sir Charles Daughter, who's the father of VIR, and this is one of our fellows. He's a trainee. He's a trainee like most of you in the audience. Okay, and he's doing this complex intervention. Of course, towards the ends of his fellowship, but you know he's he's doing all this right now. So, to drive home the point that this is all within the realm of training of an interventional radiologist, you all get trained to do this. So, doing this is not rocket science. You'll you'll slowly learn this over time and can eventually do this. Again, what has changed is um, the ability to you know our, our modern tools. You know this. Uh, Dr. Watts will talk about a lot about modern tools, but this is a simple atherectomy device. Okay, it shaves off the calcium. And, and opens the artery. So these are modern tools. We have got modern techniques, pedal access, uh, pedal loops, and advanced techniques. So uh, what has this led to? Has this made us uh, glorified plumbers? Uh, this is a slide. Uh, I thought I'd show this because this was actually uh, a picture that I took in front of our hospital. Okay, uh, This is uh, drain surgeons, sewer, and plumbing specialists. And coincidentally, it was actually parked at a trauma IR on-call spot. So I thought this is interesting and I, I put it up there. So what what have we, where have we reached with, with interventions? Are we just technical experts? And again, bringing on Sir Charles' daughter, he spoke this at an American College of Surgeons meeting in 1968. This is 45 years ago. And what he said was, and still relevant to our, to our conversations now, if my fellow angiographers are unwilling or unable to accept responsibilities, clinical responsibilities, they'll end up being high-priced plumbers and it may end up in forfeiture of territorial rights. And this is so relevant in this, in this situation. So how, do, how does the interventional radiology community react? Okay, uh, yes, sir. Okay, uh, and this is what is happening in a lot of interventional radiology uh, practices. You know, we are moving towards providing comprehensive vascular care. Okay, uh, talking about, you know, do, participating in vascular lab clinics, doing ultrasounds, 
and participating in the wound care centers. And I mean, a lot of uh, clinics are participating in wound care centers. We are, uh, you know, we participate in the wound care center along with the multidisciplinary specialties, includes podiatry, infectious disease, internal medicine, and take care of this patient. So this is this is where uh, clinical clinical IR has moved. Uh, the advantage is, is you get to see pre and post, okay? And these are pretty dramatic images. This is a patient who came to the ER with a cold leg. His right leg is not moving, right? Uh, we performed an intervention, and uh, this on a Friday. On Saturday, my fellow went and sent me this picture. He, you know, the patient walked home the next day, you know, avoiding amputation or any major surgery. You see chronic wounds, diabetic, chronic, non-healing wound. We performed a complex intervention. The wound started healing. So these are dramatic results that get us excited about this particular aspect of our specialty. And, you know, I think it, this should excite all of you to, to be doing, to be seeking to do more of PAD work in your in your training and in your in your practice. So this is where we are with interventions. Uh, and I, uh, and uh, Joji will talk more, Dr. Vakatanchari will talk more about this, how to build your practice. Um, let's get a little bit into current classifications. And I'm, classifications are usually boring, right? You, you, you know, it's always a classification. I'm going to, Point out relevant classifications that are going to be important for you to know and take home. Okay, so two types of classifications: clinical and anatomic. Okay, and this is this is a wide range of classifications that exist. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to talk about a few, and we're going to talk about the ones that are colored. Okay, Rutherford, Task, Angiosome, Wi-Fi. Okay, nothing beyond this. And the reason this is important is because this is guides your management. Okay, so it's very very important that you know these classifications ahead of time. Rutherford, most of us know this, but it's R1 to R6, okay? R0 is asymptomatic patients, and this is all the risk factors for PAD, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, uh, and all these things. So smoking, diabetes is the major factor. But these patients may still be asymptomatic, but we have to know to manage them clinically, change their medication, manage their hypertension, manage their diabetes, all these things. Uh, R1 to R3 is claudication, so mild, moderate, severe. okay? Claudication, as most of you know, is pain when 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 moving when walking and it stops when you rest. Okay, so basically it's an ischemic type of pain. Critical limb ischemia. This is like the magic word right now in the PAD world. Okay, critical limb ischemia is not an emergency but an urgency. Okay, it is it is limb threatening. It is it it can end up being life threatening. There are again R4 to R6. Okay, we have moved from R1 to R3, which is claudication, to R4 to R6. R4 is rest pain. But the patient often puts the leg down in order to relieve their pain. R5 is minor tissue loss or ulceration. And R6 is the most advanced stage where it's gangrene. Okay, again, at every stage of this process, inter interventional radiology and endovascular interventions have a role, either pre surgery, post surgery, uh, stuff like that. So moving on to test. Okay, test is anatomical. and you know, there's tasks for iliac, tasks for femoral. And don't go into details about this, but there's a task A to D. A basically is very mild angiographic stenosis, okay? And it goes on to D, which is more complex. It involves multiple vessels, chronic total occlusions, and stuff like that. It is, it is, it is a range of angiographic stenosis. Again, anatomical. This is not clinical, okay? The importance is because it sort of guides our management, whether it's endovascular or surgical. And of course, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of controversies about this, but it gives you a fair idea and provides a great framework framework for a therapeutic approach. So it's important to know task classifications. Angiosomes, guiding factor for crit critical limb ischemia. Okay, what is angiosomes? So this is an ulcer of the foot, right? This is this is a, a view of the foot from below. If you look at the picture down. You know, you see the blood vessels there, right? There are no blood vessels in the region of ulcer. So in, in, the, in the red marked area, there are no vessels. Our aim is to provide blood vessels to that area to promote healing. Because when you provide blood, you provide oxygen, you provide, and it, it promotes healing. So basically the leg, just a basic concept is there are three angiosomes, okay? Anterior tibial in the red, posterior tibial in the green, and, uh, and peroneal in, 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 in the light green below. And, our, and the importance of this is because you need to provide blood flow to that area of the wound, okay? So for example, if this is the wound shown in black, you need to provide inline flow to that wound to, to, to promote healing, okay? And this is what is called inline flow or direct vascularization. This is what we aim as endovascular specialists to do every time, okay? Now, there are some situations where it's difficult to do it, we don't get to it, and then there's something called 
indirect revascularization, which is providing some flow. So maybe in this case, you may, if you cannot open the anterior tibial artery, you go from the back and open the posterior tibial artery. Okay, so you provide some flow to healing. And although most data shows that direct vascularization is the way to go, but indirect vascularization also can help. So this is the angiosomal concept, similar to a dermatome. It's just that there's a blood vessel supplying the skin and soft tissues. Okay. Uh, wild type, again, a modern classification. You don't need to know much details, but it's wound, ischemia, and foot infection. It is similar to, in our oncology world, interventional oncology world, what we know about in PNM staging. Okay, It's a little more comprehensive assessment of complexity, and we can talk about this in future webinars, but as of now, this is all you need to know. It, it really helps in uh, prognosticating our interventions. No talk of... Uh, um, uh, PAD goes without acute limb ischemia, a vascular emergency. Okay, uh, again, as you know, in an internship in your medical school, it's the six P's. Okay, and this is a real emergency. You need to get it as soon as possible. Okay, again, I won't get into details about it, but there's a sub separate Rutherford classification for ALI, which is three three stages. Okay, one is viable, usually heparinized, irreversible, usually beyond our scope. Usually, this is where surgical specialties come in, and you know, we talk about options there. What is more in international radiology range is whether it's threatened, salvageable, or non-salvageable. And this is, again, not getting details, but you want to see for sensory and motor functions. If sensory function is intact, it's a great candidate. Motor functions, it goes into the other side, but it can still be, still be salvaged. So again, acute limb ischemia is something we do quite a lot in our practice. Uh, last slide. So join us in saving limbs. I hope we can get you excited about uh, in interventional radiology, about uh, peripheral arterial disease. Um, there's truly CLR fighters. This is a huge group of uh, interventional radiologists and other specialties who are joining together to fight critical limb ischemia, which is a big you know, epidemic, not really a pandemic, but really an epidemic. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Keith. Wonderful historical perspective uh, showing where the specialty and actually the field of endovascular interventions has grown in over 50 years since Charles Dodder's uh, initial intervention. Yeah, I like the, uh, the the fact that you oversee or give a great overview of the language of vascular disease, right? We have to speak the language of our vascular medicine colleagues or any specialist that intervenes in this arena. Rutherford classification, um, uh, angiosomes, uh, Wi-Fi, acute limb ischemia. With regards to task classification, I think, um, you know, some people will will uh, uh, won't argue about the classification itself per se, from most basic to more complex uh, disease states or or occlusions. But I think um, for many trainees, it's important to know that even in this environment now, that more task C and D lesions are being approached from an endovascular perspective. Uh, is that the case in your practice as well? I, I know that there's a trend towards more complex, but it, it's not to suggest that task D is no longer um, an endovascular opportunity. What's your thoughts on that? Yes, correct. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into many details about that to create controversies, but yeah, uh, I think a lot of, you know, I showed the proprietal trifurcation reconstruction that we did just last week, which, you know, otherwise would have been a surgical case. But, you know, we have to realize that a lot of these patients are not surgical candidates. And that's where, because they've got heart disease, they've got a lot of other comorbidities, so they end up getting endovascular interventions. All right. Um... Our next speaker is, is it Dr. Bella Hausen? It's Hausen. Hausen, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> Running a, uh, IR head to toe. I guess we'll, we'll move to you, Dr. Hausen. Thank you. Um, I slightly edited the title because I couldn't fit it all in. Um, so I'm Bella, I'm based in the UK. Um, I'm not sure whether you can see this is a rarity. There's light. Um, I'm in Manchester. We, we don't get sun. So today <laughs> happened. I don't know how, why. But um, OK, so I suspect that most of you are either training um, students or in an attachment of some sort. Um, the, the way you would probably go through this system is variable depending on which country you're based. Um, so I can't really give you um, specific guidance in that sense, but what I can tell you is to try your best to follow or attend things like this one, a webinar um, that goes across countries because peripheral vascular disease is going to be the same wherever you go. Um, the basic techniques are going to be the same. 
uh, wh whichever country you're at. But do join societies, do join um, lots of social media groups because that's how you're going to get most of the information. Um, some of the things that you will see or you'll be attached to can be daunting, but it's it's a really fun ride and I would definitely recommend it. Um, so I'm sure that a lot of my colleagues will mention this. Uh, we are clinicians. We're not reporting monkeys. We're not performing monkeys. We think for our own. We are there to help other teams and we collaborate and work with other teams. For you, when you join our team, um, we would expect you to understand the basics of patient interaction. That's the ability to chat with a patient, which I'm sure most of you are going to be very competent at. Um, to be able to consent the patient, so to give them some background and understanding to the procedure, and then have a little bit more of a chat because each patient will need um, different things or has different aspects to ask. And then there's the actual action part. Um, from managing their pain to the actual procedure and the follow-up immediately after the procedure and then the follow-up 30 days, three months, six months, depending on what you've done. Now, I work in an area where my population is very, very mixed. So I could have um, a medical attorney as a patient, so I'm shitting myself half of the time, to somebody who doesn't even know what hospital is. So be prepared to what kind of patients you're dealing with and be sympathetic and empathetic to how they may react or behave to what you say um, and just work with them. Um, you will find that, that we deal with a lot of IVDU, so drug abuse. Uh, again, it depends on your region. So again, pain management may, may, may become an issue. Um, and I think that's not necessarily just for us as IRs, but any profession that has to deal with these patients, uh, it's the same skill. So it's a skill that if you've got it from elsewhere, fantastic, you'll just be able to bring it along here. If you learn it from us, it's a skill you can take anywhere and use it. Um, and then there are the amazing patients that you may not have a, an answer for, you may not be able to deal with, and that's okay. Um, we will all, in our career, somehow, somewhere, um, come across them, and, and that's absolutely fine. You could either send them to somebody else, um, which I tend to do, to Lorenzo down south, or you, know, you can get another colleague to come and help you out, or give them time and see them in another different phase. In terms of your IR um, station or working area, again, it will depend on your country and um, your hospital setup. I tend to say don't have high expectations. It's, it's not going to be a matrix setup. Um, but again, I've, I've worked in places where it's absolutely amazing high tech. And these rooms may be called IR suites. They may be called operating suites. They may be called hybrid suites. It doesn't matter what they're called as long as you're able to do the procedure and see as many cases as possible. Um, I doubt very much that there is any site private or government based that will offer you this kind of um, setup or layout. Um, but you will work in places where there's a huge amount of technology, amazing advanced kit, um, and you might work somewhere where there isn't. And again, it doesn't matter because the basic skills you will gain wherever you go. So things to take note of in terms of the IR room and the setup and the layout. First of all, it's yourself, um, making sure that you're comfortable, that you're safe. Um, and, and that does require a little bit of background reading. It might be in your training program that you have physics and radiation protection. Um, but if it's not there, that's absolutely fine. There's a lot of information everywhere. So just make sure you understand the basics of why we use lead aprons, why we hide behind lead shields wherever, we're po wherever possible, and why sometimes we take a step back from the patient, not because they smell, but <laughs> it's all to do with the radiation protection. Um, and then with time, try to understand what's best for you, the table position, table height, the setup, and how you work. Um, you may be right-handed, but you may find that when you do procedures, it's not your right hand that does the work. So again, all that will come with experience, and, and the more experience you gain, the more that you should adapt that to make yourself comfortable, because this is a long journey. You're not doing this job just for Christmas. It's something you want to keep on for life. Lots of kit, lots of toys, 
I would say that this profession, and in particular working with uh, peripheral vascular disease, is probably the most advanced um, profession you can get. The most kit, the most fancy toys. I don't really know anybody else apart from cardiology, but even with cardiology, it's just the heart, whereas with IR, it's literally from toe to head. So, you, you know, if there's something you don't like, there will be 5,000 other things that you will like. Um, and the kit is, is phenomenal. Um, there's a lot out there and you're bound to find something that you can work with. You'll be taught on many things, not necessarily everything, but you will come across in your training various um, bits and pieces of kit. Now, there's a lot, so I can't go through everything, but I'll try and show you some of the basic things. Some of them are not necessarily related to peripheral vascular disease. This, for example, cryotherapy, radiofrequency therapy. This deals with um, cancer type treatments. It may be that it will come cross cover with peripheral vascular as we start developing more laser and radiofrequency technology in the way we deal with uh, peripheral vessels. But, you know, it's a skill. If you've got it, you're not going to lose it. You can apply it to all sorts of other uh, procedures. We have what's called um, various aspiration thrombectomy devices. These are things that help us suck clot out of the body and remove it. And again, various different kits. Again, this can be used for the peripheral system, so lower limb, arms, or it can be used for the neuro system, so in stroke where you have clots shooting off. If you learn that particular skill, it can be adapted. So this technique came to us from stroke and we've adapted it to peripheral, so lower limb clots. We also have um, CO2. Um, so some of our patients have um, severe kidney disease or allergies to contrast. And a lot of our work, not all of it, but a lot of it is based on using iodinized contrast. And so if a patient is allergic or has issues with kidney function, it's fantastic that now we have this option of using CO2. Um, not every site and every center will have it, so don't worry if you don't, but I'm sure during your rotation or your experience you may come across it. And like everything we do with IR, it has its limitations. You can't use everything for everything, otherwise, you know, there'll be no fun in what we do. Um, so with the CO2 that we do use, there are areas that you might be able to use it, for example, lower limb, so peripheral arterial disease is fantastic, but sometimes you may not necessarily be able to use it for any abdominal work or central um, venous work, but that's all under development, um, and it might be by the time you guys graduate or you're actually staff, this will be a thing of the past, and I'm just talking crap now. Um, the setup and layout, I wouldn't worry too much about it because, again, it depends where you go. It might be a different machine and how you do it. Another fancy kit um, is, is using lithotripsy. For those of you who've done general medicine before, you may be aware of that term being used to break or crack um, renal stones. So that technology had been brought over um, and used in cardiology. And then from cardiology has been brought over to us for peripheral arterial disease. So if we've got heavily calcified arteries, we can use this technology to try and crack that calcium. And of course, the way we work in IR or endovascular is we tend to manipulate and use things for other stuff, even if it's licensed or an IFU to use, for example, only on lower limb, you'll find that a lot of us with experience may use it for other stuff that we feel is safe and competent to use. So for example, I might use this to crack calcium um, in renal arteries or SFA or other places that it might not be necessarily where you're supposed to use it. So finally, access, and I'm sorry that we've just gone a bit outside the time. To do your treatment, you need to be able to actually access the site that you um, need to work on. And this is where the fun begins. Um, IR or endovascular, you cover all the way from pediatrics to geriatrics. Not many professions are able to do that. So the skill, the basic skill you gain, you're able to cover a wide range of body organs, wide range of diseases. If you're like me, I'm, I'm purely vascular, so I tend to deal mostly with vessels. But it doesn't mean that if tomorrow I get a patient um, who requires a nephrostomy, which is a tube in a dilated kidney, that I can't do it because there's a lot of the basic skills that are applied. You can then use them. Um, and a lot of the work we do 
usually isn't blinded, which is the term I use as clinical. We tend to use guidance of ultrasound, fluoroscopy, CT, nuclear medicine markers, and I'm sure there's more to come uh, as we advance. I'd say that this is probably the best thing I learned when I first started, and that's the cell dinger technique. It sounds fairly simple and easy, but if you get that completely perfect, you probably could do the basics to everything that we do, because everything else is just a complex version of the bit, this basic technique. Thank you very much, and thanks um, everybody for being patient and waiting. Thanks a lot. Excellent talk, Bella, and um, uh, it's very exciting to go, you know, through all the um, aspects of, of taking care of the patient as a whole. Um, just a quick question about the radiation piece, and you you mentioned, um, you know, radiation protection and taking care of yourself, and you know, as a you know a vascular operator, you know, dealing with getting anti-grade access or radial access or foot access, and then trying to protect yourself from radiation. We use radiation shield. Can you just take, you know, talk me through how um, you manage that part and do you always try to keep a radiation shield and sometimes it's in your way? Do you try to kind of keep that um, going the whole time? Yeah, so I'm a bit of a psycho. Um, I'm literally, I have the heaviest lead on, um, I, I'm, I'm kitted head to toe and whatever my cardiology colleague gets, I tend to steal it off him. So they've got all these shin pads and now they have this left arm cover. So I've mm -hmm. stolen that too. Um, it might be a bit, you know, OTT, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. There will be circumstances where, unfortunately, you can't. You can't, you know, you can't hide behind the lead shield because it's it's technically challenging. And until the technology catches up with us, so Siemens and HD and Philips understand a little bit more of the work that we do and, are, and they're able to formulate the C-arm in ways that we're able to get more shielding, there is a lot of DIY that you and and me would have to just make do and, and compromise in. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Bella. I appreciate you joining us. Um, Mike Watts um, is in Jersey. He's going to give us now, go through the, all the toolbox um, that you're going to need to use. He's going to whiz through it, Mike. Yeah, I will whiz through it. Uh, 10 minutes to cover a little bit of everything. You guys see my screen OK? Yes. All right. So uh, I was asked to talk about the Envascular Toolbox. Um, so I will give you a highlight um, and try not to go over time. So I have some disclosures. The other disclosure is when I was asked to talk about the Endovascular Toolbox, I thought they meant Kumar and Keith, and I was ready to just blow through 10 minutes on this. Um, but apparently that's not exactly uh, what we're talking about. We're talking about all the tools, uh, <laughs> toys, everything that we're gonna be using uh, to do peripheral arterial disease. So a little survey here. Uh, I do have a little bit that I wanna talk about wires. Wires aren't simple. Um, all this I stuff I have in wires for the next couple slides. Sorry, Mike, can, you, uh, can you go to the presentation mode? Um, it's still on the, um, we see your. Um... You see, do you don't see my uh, presentation here? Yeah, no, we see, we see just the, uh, uh, not the presentation mode, the. the... All right. Um, that's better, yeah. Yeah. Do you see every, you see, that's okay? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. All right. So uh, everything I'm talking about wires uh, is basically taken from Craig Walker. If you ever have a chance to hear him talk about uh, wires, he does a fantastic job. Um, but wires, we talk about 035 wires, which we use for a lot of general IR things. Uh, and we use it in um, PAD because they're very strong. You can advance sheaths. Uh, you can advance bigger uh, devices over 035 wires. And 0 and 8 and 0 and 4 are really for more um, finesse applications. Uh, you think maybe 0 and 4, 0 and 8, not really a big difference. But what you don't realize about wires is the strength is really related to uh, the, the the radius to the fourth power. Um, so if you're going from point, you know, 0 and 4 to point 0 and 8, you really are increasing that strength um, by by um, you know a number of times. It's actually 2.8 times from from 2.4 or from 14 to 18. Uh, and when you have a bigger wire, it's stronger, but it's less flexible. Uh, so if you need to get through small little occlusions, things like that, it's a little bit more difficult. Big, big wires are more torqueable. So if you have a, a glide wire with a 45 degree tip and you can basically have one to one torque, you move the device um, and things go from there. Uh, but you lose some trackability. Uh, I do kind of want to go to my this really you guys can't see this, huh? Yeah, yeah, we see, we see the slides. It's 
Yeah, we, we still see the okay. slide. It's not in the full presentation mode, but we see the, the slide with the side tracker on the side. But it's all right. So I, I want you to be able to see. Okay. This... Mike, right. uh, slideshow and just start the presentation. I think you have missed that. Say that again? Yeah. Uh, slideshow on the top and then start presentation. Yeah, no, no, I do, but then I, I, it's sharing it. Oh. In, it's sharing it strangely. Um, yeah, that's weird. All right. Sorry. No, I, I think there's a way. Are you are you, you doing know, here, I, got, I, got, I got you now. Look at this. Watch this. I'm so. All right. So I get rid of that. And now if I do this, I was only sharing a small window, I think, of my screen. How's that? Yep. Yeah. OK, so there I'm you. sorry. I'll, I'll go through this quickly. So you have to think about wires, what the core material are, stainless steel versus nitinol. Uh, that's changed over the course of years. Um, uh, there's new nitinols that have been developed, which most of these things are involved with. And then core taper, a longer taper um, means a more flexible wire. Uh, a shorter taper, uh, you know, usually is used for uh, exchanges and things where you're not necessarily crossing lesions. And there are multiple tapers uh, depending uh, on where you are in the wire, what the flexibility is. And all of these wires really have something to do with the what you're comfortable with and the application you're using. Uh, tip design, some have a, a wire that goes all the way through the coils. You know, some wires you'll find that you just want to put a shape on the end and it won't stay. And some wires you'll just kind of ding the end up a little bit and you can't get the uh, that shape out. Uh, and that really depends on how long the, the, the wire is through the core. And you'll realize which wires are designed in which way and you'll develop comforting with some, uh, more comfort with some than others. And then are the wires coated? Do they have a, a polymer jacket? Are they hydrophilic? Um, and if they are, is it the whole wire? Or is it just most of the wire to the tip? Uh, or something like a glide wire advantage? Is it just the tip and, and not the, the shaft of the wire so much? Um, when you're talking about hydrophilic coating, you're talking about glide wire type devices. Uh, there's lubricity and they're lubricious wires, meaning that they slide um, easily, they cross lesions very well, but you do lose tactile feedback. Um, so these are the things you have to be very careful with and, and develop experience with. You don't want to send that wire outside of the vessel um, without feeling it because you've lost tactile feedback and you expect to have the same tactile feedback that you would with other wires. Uh, wire progression, uh, just a, a small little uh, discussion here. Uh, if you if you engage a lesion and, and the wire doesn't act the way you want it to, um, what can you do? You can increase the tip gram load of the wire. So what's that mean? Uh, there are wires that have different gram tips or different strength, strengths. What that means is, is how much force has to be applied on the tip of that wire to, to bend it. So like a 30 gram tip is a pretty robust wire. You have to put a lot of force on it to bend it. Um, other tip loads are less, um, there may be some that are more, but it, it gives you a, an idea of how strong that tip is as you try to go through an occlusion. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of see how this works. The wire crosses, you know, you can use advance your uh, support cath or, or stronger rail support wire. On to catheters, I'm just gonna talk about support catheters uh, that you pair with wires to cross lesions or to give you extra support. There's basically two types, the extruded tubes, um, every company has one. They're basically just a cylinder of plastic and different strengths uh, with different tapers that, that can either help you really kind of force the wire through something or, or just track over it very easily. The extruded tubes tend to be uh, support catheters that can take more force and can, can add more pushability. And the braided catheters, like these over here, um, can have different angles. And because they're braided, they're reinforced and they don't really kink. Um, and they'll follow your wire through more uh, more intricate anatomy, maybe through the pedal loop. Uh, and some of them can be um, can be coaxial. One can go inside the other. Uh, and then there's um, some of this double braided catheter uh, actually is is a mixture of the two um, in that it has some pushability, but it still tracks extremely well. So wires, catheters, these are our main tools as we are crossing uh, lesions and and really the basis of how we perform our interventions. Uh, once we have a wire across a lesion, um, a lot of us use IVIS. Um, IVIS is, is just an extra uh, ability to really uh, identify what's going on. So you can see the vessel that you're in, what the true size of it is, uh, the true size of the vessel versus how much is stenotic versus plaque, what that plaque looks like. Is it soft plaque or calcific plaque or, you know, is it potentially thrombus? And all these things change the way you treat things. Uh, how is the plaque uh, situated on the vessel? Um, again, some of these uh, are, are treated in different ways, whether it's kind of directional atherectomy or, or stenting, or uh, some things respond better depending on the geometry of the plaque and, and where your guide wire is. When you've crossed that lesion, have you stayed in the lumen 
or have you meandered out into the submittable space and how are you going to deal with that? It's better to know than not know. Um, you may have to use a reentry device every once in a while. Basically, this is a, uh, a catheter that tracks over your wire and it will stick a needle from out of the lumen in the submittable space into the lumen. This is a great example here um, that was shown in Journal of Vascular Surgery some years ago. Just basically how this, uh, the, the orientation of the marker here points towards the vessel you want to go, points towards the vessel you want to go, fire the, the needle, the wire tracks. Mark Lesney, our colleague in interventional radiology in Charlotte, um, showed this on Twitter uh, maybe a year ago or so, basically saying that you can use this not only to puncture into a lumen, but you can mark that lumen with a balloon. And once you puncture into that balloon, you now know that you are interluminal because that's where that balloon was. You can use that balloon to pull the wire out and you've connected the spaces. Another uh, device, the Pioneer device, has the same functionality in, as the Pioneer, but it uses IVIS guidance. So when you see this image, you can see the Pioneer catheter subintimal, the chroma flow or the, the, the coloring on the IVIS shows where the true lumen is. You put that at 12 o'clock um, facing north, extend the, the, the needle and you're in. Uh, just going to give you a quick survey of atherectomy devices. This is not the reason that we're doing this talk. Um, I just want to know it's available. And this is a directional atherectomy device. This is the Hawk device uh, where you point towards where the plaque is and you shave it off, uh, pull that plaque out. This is where you see plaque art all over Twitter. And I don't know if it's there as much as it used to be, but people make designs out of the, the white fibrous plaque that used to be in the vessel and is now on the table, uh, increasing the lumen. The different kind of iteration of that is more or less the same technology, uh, but paired with OCT imaging. This is the Avenger Pantheris. Um, what this allows you to do is really visualize where the plaque is versus where the normal structures of the vessel are. And if you can remove the plaque without damaging the vessel, you have uh, significantly better long-term patency rates and much less uh, restenosis when you, uh, when you finally treat that vessel. Uh, CSI, uh, this is what Keith kind of showed briefly. Um, this is the, the eccentric kind of uh, orbital motion of a, of a sanding stone, more or less, over a wire. And the faster you spin it, the wider it goes. That's my 10 minute timer. Um, so the, the faster you spin it, the, 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 the wider the orbit, and it should sand away some of the calcium and some of the hard plaque, uh, giving you a better lumen, increasing compliance of the vessel. Uh, laser atherectomy can do multiple things, um, vaporized plaque, basically vaporized thrombus in some, in some situations uh, will increase the compliance of the vessel uh, by softening the collagen uh, and also by more or less hammering through, uh, through hard plaque. Rotational atherectomy, uh, this is the Phoenix device over here, uh, which I'm a big proponent of for many reasons. This is the jet stream device. Um, you can see that this is a great device to actually be used in stent restenosis. The laser is the only device at this point which is FDA approved um, for instant restenosis. Uh, and some of these will use an embolic protection device because you want to be able to capture all the stuff that's heading downstream. Uh, even the jet stream has active aspiration, you still kind of want to protect from showering downstream. Just very briefly, you're going to find that there, every company makes angioplasty balloons, just plain old balloon angioplasty, POBA, um, and in some, indica some uh, indications where there's a really difficult or hard stenosis, uh, a scoring or cutting balloon, uh, or a, a, another type is the chocolate balloon, which is kind of a, a, a different type of scoring balloon, but it basically allows for uh, the similar pressures all along the balloon in these different little cages. And drug-coated balloons are now... Uh, giving us more or less the results of bare metal stenting without leaving anything behind. Um, as you all know about paclitaxel issues, um, where we stand on that, there's still great devices for um, patency uh, and whether or not uh, there are um, concerns about using it, I think uh, there should be discussions with patients before you plan on that. Bare metal stents, self-expanding stents, every company makes them again, they're kind of a commodity. Uh, some are slightly better than others, um, but the, the results are basically the same. Um, which means they're about the same as a drug-coated balloon. Drug-eluting stents over here uh, tend to have better patency. Uh, there's only a few of them on the market. Uh, and, um, you know, there's, there's again, the paclitaxel issue. Balloon-expandable stents for regions that don't have compression, meaning above the inguinal ligaments, uh, when we're talking about PAD, uh, because that will, um, they have much better radial force for iliacs, uh, but they uh, can be crushed if they're uh, in compression points. 
Um, covered stent grafts, via bonds, or the VBX here, um, we can use in a lot of different uh, locations. But as far as PAD goes, uh, mostly iliacs. Dr. Sabri showed, um, you know, that that's uh, the balloon expandable stent grafts or stent grafts in the iliacs are, are great. This is the Supera stent. It's a woven nitinol stent. It's different than the other bare metal stents. It has very high uh, compression resistance, but very little outward force. So it doesn't apply any pressure on the vessel, which leads to less restenosis. And you can put it in popliteals or, or God forbid, common femorals if need be, because it's very, very flexible and it won't fracture. Uh, last thing I want to talk about real quick, closure devices. Um, you don't always need closure devices, but I think most of us probably use them all the time um, just for patient safety issues. Um, this is the per close device. It's actually a proline suture, which shows your arter arteriotomy closed. It's a tremendous device. You can use two of these in different orientations for large holes in the pre-close technique. Uh, this is a minx device. So it's a more or less a, a collagen type plug. Uh, the, you take the balloon down, remove it from the artery, nothing's left intravascularly. Similarly is the angio seal device. These are probably three most popular devices. You have this collagen type uh, closure here outside the vessel, but this foot plate remains inside uh, and will resorb hopefully in 60 days or so. Um, so you have a bunch of different options for a bunch of different tools, just a very, very quick survey of them. Um, and hopefully I did it without going too far over. And Thanks, Mike. You got Appreciate it. Appreciate that. Uh, it was a great overview. Yeah, once again, we proved that even the most seasoned operators can uh, use a refresher on PowerPoint. <laughs> this is go-to meeting. PowerPoint, I got. Go-to meeting, I don't know, nothing. No. So in, in actuality, you know, I think a, a lot of our abilities to, to do the most complex intervention owes to the significant amount of growth of uh, endovascular tools at our disposal. You went through, an, you know, a really uh, exhaustive survey in just a short amount of time. And for the trainees out there, can you just relay, do you have all of these on your shelf? How do you pick and choose, you know, briefly? No. What are no, you doing? I, I, so I, I think um, you can see online these wire charts where they have 25 different wires and, and for every different occasion. And that, that's really just not reasonable. You need to find a couple that, you're, that you are comfortable with, that you have success with, and make those work. You find you know, one brand of, of um, drug-coated balloons or, 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 or stents um, that you have good results with, that you believe the data. Um, and same thing, atherectomy device, um, you know, find something one or two you're comfortable with for maybe one that you're going to use in tibials maybe one you're gonna use above. Uh, and it just, you really have to try it. And the great thing is with the development of all this new technology, the companies are very aggressive about letting you try it, getting it in your hands. Um, so you get a chance to really feel what you're comfortable with and what you have good results with. Um, and you kind of go from there, but it's a very personal decision um, <laughs> for a lot of these things. And, and you can get pretty territorial over what you use versus what you don't, uh, or maybe I do and nobody else does. No, I think that's absolutely great advice and, and gives it context to the talk you just gave. So thank you. Perfect. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker coming from uh, another speaker from the London, UK, Sergeant Lorenzo Patron, who's going to lead the, the next uh, edition of this boot camp. Welcome, Lorenzo. We Good can't evening. hear you, Dr. Patron. Uh, Can't hear you. Now you should no, be able to. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, great. Sorry for that. So, uh, I mean, for, as I was saying, I'm a, I'm a vascular interventional radiologist, and it's I'm very proud of, and I think it's very basic for us, and you will see in my presentation, to be clinicians and not technicians, because it's like in the, if we are just skipping to our stages of uh, technicians in our labs, then we won't go very further. So I just want to, you know, first very briefly introduce, you know, what is the meaning of this uh, uh, webinar, which is the meaning of this kind of meeting between us as a PAD lovers and uh, the, the, the registrars and the medical students. So in this kind of paper coming, uh, who came out last year, it was evaluation of uh, the statewide variability in the current role of different specialties in lower limb endovascular vascularization. You can see how the IRs really don't play a big role, and it's less and less. They started with doctor, as uh, it was said before, but then, you know, probably we're not playing any more such a big role as before. And this is why. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, we can't wait anymore to wait for the vascular surgeons or to any kind of other clinician to phone us and saying, oh, dude, I have a patient for you. No, this is not happening anymore, and it will happen uh, not anymore, especially in the future. 
So we have to come out like clinicians, as I said, and not technicians. Go out and do the job ourselves. So we, for whoever wants to be an interventional judge in the future, you don't have to look at yourself like in this position with your tie, with your shirt, just sit on a chair, but you have to see yourself treating patients with your imaging in your cath lab. But to do that, you need to be completely involved in the care of the patient. You need to be the doctor to go to the bed of the patient. You need to be the one who the patient feels uh, to be his or her doctor. And uh, to be able to do that, you need to uh, know the basics of the clinical judgment of a patient to understand who needs a treatment and not. And this has to be very clear. And I want to especially focus uh, on uh, this kind of segment, like, as it was asked to me from uh, the organizers, especially the auto femoral, uh, iliac femoral popliteal segment is the one who's uh, the most, uh, uh, let's say, fancy for any kind of specialty because the vessels are bigger compared to the below the knee vessels. So that's why we need to be clinicians. So I want to ask you, do you understand? And I want to... I want you to answer this way. You need to be very motivated. This is a boot camp, so you need to be very engaged in this. And uh, the important thing is to know the right for classification. Right for classification divides the patients in different uh, groups, so mild to moderate claudication. That's severe uh, claudication with ischemic rest pain. And then there's the proper, proper tissue loss, so minor tissue loss. Uh, most of the patients that we treat in our, in our, probably our facilities are right for five, so ulcers on the feet, and then right for six where the, you know, the tissue loss is very important. So, and uh, to do this, we need to uh, ask ourselves some questions and to know, uh, especially some uh, details. So the first thing you need to do is a, is a proper um, inspection and a proper visit and a proper palpation of the different pulses. So the femoral pulse, the popliteal pulse, and the distal pulses. And after you've done that, you know, you'll be very comfortable in uh, saying that if there's a dorsalis pedis pulse, you can feel that, or a posterior tibial pulse, you don't have to treat these patients because it means like the, the vascular disease is very minor. And so if the patient comes to you and say, God, you know, I, I feel some pins and needles and pain, and I'm very in pain, and there are um, distal pulses, then your answer to a treatment should be like this. You don't have to treat this patient again. So in the boot camp, you need to understand which patient you need to treat and which not. And uh, the patient with claudication uh, said, you know, it should be uh, major symptoms, aging and burning leg muscles, reliably reproduce a set distance walking, relieved within minutes of rest, never present at rest, and not exacerbated by position. And different occlusions or disease can give you different symptoms. So, for example, especially the disease at the level of the aorta and the common iliac artery gives you also pain in the buttocks. So the patient, when it walks, say, I have pain in my calves, but also pain in my buttocks. And that means that already, without even doing any kind of CT scan, you know that it could be an aortic disease or a common iliac disease where also the hypogastric or internal iliac artery is uh, uh, involved. And if the patient comes to you with a 200-meter claudication, what answer do you have to give to him? Do you, do, would you treat that patient? Sir, no, sir. Sir, no, sir. Again, you know, 20 meter claudication is an excellent uh, way to, to modify the lifestyle and to try to be conservative as possible. And, uh, for example, you need to act on the smoke, on the weight. Of course, some patients are overweighted, are high level of cholesterol, diabetes and heart problems, hypertension, and also, you know, you need to investigate if there's any kind of history in the family of uh, uh, PAD. And uh, this is a typical patient that we can uh, find uh, in, our, in our clinic, you know, the, the patient was like overweight, was like it's, uh, it's used to have uh, junk food and also smoke. And you have to talk very clearly to these patients. You need to motivate them to stop. But, for example, if you want to say to them, you need to stop smoking. You can't just say, okay, you need to stop smoking from now on. You need to know all the possible alternatives because you are their doctor. It's not someone else who needs to do this job. It's you. So you need to know nicotine patches, nicotine inhalers, nicotine sprays, nicotine lozenges, nicotine gum, nicotine microtab, e-cigarettes. You need to know all this. You need to give all these alternatives to him to try to motivate him not to smoke anymore. So again, do you understand this? Very well. So I hear your thought uh, very loud. So now, again, you know, if you want to ask the patient to lose weight, you need to know, you know, how to motivate him. And also, maybe in this case, you can move him to a dietitian. But you also know that the basic uh, medical therapy for any kind of vascular peripheral artery disease is atorvastatin. So one of the statins anyway, to try to uh, level the low of cholesterol, so also to 
um, to work on the plaques and also aspirin, 75 milligrams. This is the basic medical therapy for any kind of patient, even without an intervention. You need to know how to set up this in your clinic. So now, next step, which are the tests that you need to do to uh, understand how bad is the disease? So there's a one, it's very easy, it's called ABPI, ankle brachial pressure index. So you measure the pressure at the level of the arm, which usually is not, is not affected by any kind of uh, uh, disease and uh, at the level of the cough. And uh, the, the ratio between the two is, is, uh, is crucial because if the patient, for example, has a ratio between 0 0.4 and 0 0.7, that means it's a moderate peripheral artery disease. So even a patient with claudication can be uh, probably considered for treatment, invasive treatment with endovascular solution because probably his claudication is affecting his life uh, in, a, in, a, in a significant way. So, and then you can perform a treatment test and forget about having people like this, but usually this is the setup, a bit more depressing, but this is what it is. And uh, the treatment test is a very accurate way to measure the claudication distance, because if it falls at more than 20% from the baseline, it's significant. So, for example, if you start from a, a baseline of 0 0.7, you go to 0 0.4 after one minute of, of, uh, of, uh, of walking, that means probably your disease is quite severe. And uh, usually, you know, that to come back to normal, it takes uh, more or less three minutes. So who will be treated at that point? It would be someone with active life, severely impaired by short walking distance and no improvement with conservative treatment. And what about rest pain? If you remember, this was a five stage of Rutherford classification, which I showed you before, and which should be very, very clear in your mind. Rest pain could be acute, so the limb could be cold, could be loss of sensation, could be loss of mobility, and could be pale color. So a foot like this, especially when it's uh, raised up, and uh, when uh, the, the case is even worse, the foot can become muscled and uh, more at risk. This needs something very urgent to be done. This could be embolic, could be thromboembolic. It's important to know all these things, but I don't have time to, to show you all the, the possible causes. And then the chronic pain, where like nocturnal pain, and uh, the patient needs to sleep with the legs outside from the bed or needs to go for a walk during the night because the cramps are crucifying him or her. So that's, uh, it's also uh, sometimes uh, a match with leg swelling, loss of air, a burger test positive. So I hope that every one of you knows what's a burger test, but just because I don't trust you, I will show you again. And this is like when you elevate the foot more or less 45 degrees, you can see the pallor and the venous guttering and uh, the foot becomes very, very pale. And uh, when you put the, the leg uh, down again, the same, this is the same foot when uh, the, the leg is down, it's a rubber. So all the, all the flow is going finally to this foot and then it's a really critical sign of ischemia. So for example, look at this, it's like chronic uh, uh, PAD with chronic uh, um, ischemia of the toes. And this is seven days after, revas after revascularization. You can see that how the toes are completely changing color. Even the small ulcers on the first toe are getting some more blood and look completely different. So who will be treated in this case? It's more or less everyone. We know that CLI is a killer, is a silent killer, uh, because you know if you correlate the number of uh, cases with death within five years, you can see that CLI is very, is very uh, um, a dangerous killer. So always remember also to look at the feet of your patient, because you know sometimes there's an ulcer, and so take off the, the the sock, and this is very important. Maybe it takes a little bit long in your clinic, but it's very important. And sometimes you have to also to understand how to smell. The feet of uh, your patient because for example the pseudomonas is a very strong and characteristic odor and you need to be uh, very aware that this can be uh, critical for the patient to be able to recognize that at the beginning of your visit so after that which kind of imaging so there's the duplex and the duplex is very useful because from uh, like you can see on the screen 62.7 centimeters a second this was the tp trunk as a normal velocity it can go up to 222 centimeters a second when the Stenosis is very critical, so this is a very good way to understand properly the stenosis. The CT is very important for the autoaliac disease, especially because it can show not only that the vessel is occluded, but there could be a, you know, some sort of aortic involvement and also some, some uh, aneurysmatic disease, as in this case. And also, the, the CT permits us to see to, and to have uh, similar angiographic uh, images, and this also permits us to measure the vessel accurately. The um, MRA is also important. You can see here a flap of dissection, and uh, it can give you a really, really uh, good imaging, especially if you are able to uh, produce nice uh, uh, protocols. So that, like in this case, the important thing is like uh, 
uh, try to be quick. If the MRA takes too much time to be booked, go ahead because critical limb ischemia has, uh, uh, has this paradigm which is like uh, uh, time is tissue. Angiogram is like it's the base of our intervention. You can see here, you know, an angiogram with an alien occlusion, and then uh, you can even use CO2. It's also Dr. Wazen has shown us for, for critical limb ischemia, and sometimes the patients are in chronic kidney disease and can go down to the landing zone. You can see the very slow flow in this case where there's no popliteal artery, they're just a trifurcation. So, which kind of treatment? That's the last part of my presentation. It's like, a, for example, I want to show you this case very quickly. 57 year old, recently a smoker. I want to show you this uh, uh, video, which here, like, uh, as uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the disease starts here at the level of the, the, the ILAC. And this patient, as we know, is a rest pain, right lower limb. Remember this. And then you, so you can, we can talk about our algorithm. And in this case, again, you know, uh, you can see how the, the disease, uh, okay, so it's, it's uh, continuous there with the two tight stenosis of the uh, external artery, and then everything like pharmacological artery is a bit disease, but not too much. That means that uh, you need to revascularize the right lower limb, and to do this, you need to, uh, of course, do an angiogram, and on the angiogram, you see very well this, uh, uh, two, these two stenosis, you can see also on uh, the 2D images, how it, it could be uh, not easy to judge. And so the CT is very important to understand how bad is the stenosis. The stenosis was easily passed intraluminally and then an angel was done and a balloon angioplasty with stent, eight millimeter stent, the diameter measure on the CT. And this is the final result, which is pretty good. So if you go down and then you see the vessels there, you can see that's a phase occluded and the reconstitution at the level of the popliteal with quite a pretty brisk flow. And then again, the popliteal is occluded with a almost a trifurcation involved, and uh, the flow to the foot is good, but you can see that the posterior tibial artery is occluded. So would you treat this patient then in SFA in the popliteal? No, and you know why? Because there's this kind of vessel which needs to be very clear, it's very important, a profonda femoral artery. The role of profundoplasty and the, the, the good uh, profonda femoral artery is more than enough in many of the cases for patients with rest pain. So you need to know all this kind of stuff. And you have to say no to all the treatments. It's not fancy. It's not uh, useful for this patient to go for a complete SFA revascularization and TP trunk stenting and posterior tibial artery revascularization. Because you know, good surgeon is know who how to operate. But I have to say that uh, this is not in our case a good surgeon, but a good IR know how to operate. Better one know when to operate, and the best when not to operate. So always remember that when you when you uh, keep it in mind when you have like uh, of course uh, you know a common femoral artery occlusion then if there's indication you can do fancy stuff you can do kissing ballooning at the level of the common femoral you can stand the common femoral having a very good result in case especially patients are not uh, fit for any surgery but if you have for example a, a, a disease like this where the SFA is uh, completely occluded and also the profound femoral artery is stenotic it's only uh, usually a matter of surgery. But if the patient cannot tolerate surgery, it's up to you to understand and to judge and to refer the patient eventually to someone else. If the patient has a long SFA occlusion with a, the profonda femoral artery, you can perform most of fancy stuff, fancy stenting, like in this case where the profonda femoral artery was stented and SFA2 was recanalized and the final result was incredibly good. But remember, you are the clinician. If you think that this is not indicated, then you have to call your vascular surgeon. Don't wait for the vascular surgeon to call you. You are the clinician. You choose the treatment and you choose the operator. And uh, the take home message and of all this presentation is like you have to know the symptoms, know your patient, know your options, and know your limits. And after that, if you know all this, you know, you need to show the face war and, uh, and go for it because it, it, this is then uh, your, your time to operate and I want to show you as uh, the last picture, summer 2009, this was me, the first year as interventional geology registrar and I was very motivated, I would like to be, uh, you to be the same as I was and thank you for your attention. Um, thanks Lorenzo, this was amazing and um, very energetic uh, as expected. So uh, you went through a lot and uh, I really enjoyed it a ton. I, I would say the I liked that how you focused on uh, conservative management and how to the stage approach, you know, for patients with rest pain and claudication, fixing only the iliac and not going through a full revascularization below the inguinal ligament if you don't need to. Um, let me ask you, for example, if somebody is, comes to you with claudication and has only femoral popliteal disease, um, do you do endovascular uh, intervention on them or do you? do conservative and when do you switch from from conservative to actually treating them 
Exactly, it's all about symptoms. So this, this is important. You know, I'm pretty proud of being in UK and having my own vascular clinic where I see my patients. It's all about talking to the patient. For example, let's say there's a patient number one who comes to you because he's a 45-year-old courier with a 50-meter claudication, and he can't go to work because his uh, his claudication is affecting him, and it's it is at risk of losing his his work, and not his limb, but his work. So in this case, I'm very keen in intervening in some way, especially, you know, of course you want to leave nothing behind, but you understand this is very crucial for the patient. But let's say there's a 75 year old who doesn't uh, walk more than 20 meters and this affects him just when he goes uh, to the supermarket, then of course I would be as much conservative as possible. So again, our care, and it, I don't see that happening very often in uh, our practice as uh, interventional radiologists, needs to be patient centric. And we need to be the, not only the operators, but also the clinician. And this is, there's a lot of work to be done from societies to achieve this, to achieve, uh, you know, the, to have the, 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 the fellows to be, and also the, the consultants, uh, clinicians and not technicians. So I heard you're uh, muted. Can't hear you anymore? Yeah. <laughs> Did I leave you speechless? <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Um, yeah, I don't want to distract you talking. Yeah, so I was saying that um, I think this is this is great advice to take care of the patient before, during, and after the procedure, and know when to uh, operate and when not to. Um, so thanks, Lorenzo. So uh, moving, um, it's it's our pleasure uh, to have Dr. Uh, Vimal Sanchwar, who is uh, joining us um, from Mumbai, and uh, he's the president of the Indian Society of Vascular Interventional Radiology. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, you know tibial artery revascularization and tricks. So thanks a lot for joining us. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, really happy to have, uh, you know, going on with this program. And um, uh, the, 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 when I'm talking about tibula, is it coming? My slides are coming on? Or? No, Dr. Sameshwar, you have to share the slides on the top. Uh, I well, sent you an invitation. Yeah, just a minute. Let me just get my daughter in. She will jo join me in here. Right. And, uh, while we set while we set this up, uh, can you just comment on this other question I asked Lorenzo about, um, you know, if you have this is a common issue that we see that we have a lot of internal popliteal disease. How are you managing it at your, um, at your institution now? Just you should briefly talk about it. I, are you talking about isolated femoral popliteal disease? Correct. Isolated femoral popliteal disease with um, a patient with just fem pop lesions and has claudication. Um, are you? You know, trying to do as much of an, you know conservative management before going yes. forward. To... Yeah, yeah. So I think you know, I think that it would be extremely rare for a surgical intervention, and so endovascular is more likely. But I want the patient to be invested. So we talk about <laughs> natural history of the disease and how significant is the claudication? Is it a mild or is it a significant claudication? And I do do a a trial of something conservative for a period of time, get the patient invested into that management. And ultimately, if they feel they can't tolerate this anymore, and they've really tried, despite uh, the discussions we've had, and this includes risk factor modification, stop smoking, including uh, aspirin, um, uh, lipid therapy, so on and so forth, then we, we embark on a potential endovascular revasc. Awesome. Thanks a lot for your input. Uh, Dr. Sancho, we have your um, uh, uh, slide, so go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you again, and uh, sorry for this little delay. So uh, when we talk about uh, tibial arterial revascularization, actually more or less the same tips and tricks that you use when you want to revascularize most of the other areas like your iliac or femoral. So I'm gonna uh, kind of show you some of the devices and the techniques that we use to revascularize tibial arteries. And what are the challenges that we face while uh, treating this territory? Now, uh, the, uh, the tibial arterial occlusive disease is a very challenging territory. Primarily, you know, you have uh, multivessel disease. You may have anterior tibial, peroneal, posterior tibial, all three of them or a couple of them involved, and you may have to treat all of them. It may be a multi-level disease where you have to answer the iliac, the femorals, and then come down and treat the tibial arteries. These arteries could be occlusive. That means there is no flow through the segment and could be really hard calcified lesions. But if you're lucky and they're just stenotic, it becomes relatively easy to pass that stenotic segment with a soft wire. 
these uh, arterial diseases are often very long segments, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree. You may get lengths which are about 20, 25, 30 centimeters that you need to dilate and open up. The vessels primarily are very small diameter ranging from 3.5 to maybe 2 or 1.5 centimeter as you go distally in the foot region. Often the osteal lesions are there, which becomes very difficult to negotiate, and you would not know where to actually go and manipulate the wire, and that becomes very challenging. If the disease is across the joint, again, the challenge is different, especially at the knee level and at the ankle level. There's often a lot of calcification and could become very difficult to treat. And uh, as Keith showed us initially, you may have to cross the plantar arch to actually do a arch technique to cover up the anterior and posterior tibial and open up these vessels. So really a challenging territory when you talk of uh, tibial arteries. And once you can do these um, uh, areas, I'm sure the SFA and the popliteal, even the iliac become relatively easy, though the technique at every segment uh, changes and varies in these areas. Now, very important for any uh, revascularization is the, uh, the sheets that you have and the support catheters that you need. These support catheters and uh, sheets help you to manipulate your wire uh, efficiently. If you don't have these, you tend to buckle up the wire and the wires can go into another territory and not really go through the segment that you want to uh, negotiate. So these sheets and wires are very important. Especially in the uh, tibial territories, you may use a crossover sheet coming from the contralateral uh, femoral puncture and crossover across the uh, iliac bifurcation and come down. And uh, you may uh, use a long sheet that is there, which will bring it down all the way up to the popliteal territory. So these crossover sheets are quite um, useful in some of these areas when you want to do uh, contralateral puncture, puncture and come down into the tibial arteries. But often one would like to come down uh, through the ipsilateral puncture and what we call as the um, uh, uh, ipsilateral puncture and anti-grade puncture, uh, especially in the tibial arteries where there are long calcified lesion, you would like to use an uh, ipsilateral uh, anti-grade puncture. Uh, so this combination of sheath, catheter, and wire is something which will help you go past these tight territories. And as I think Matt uh, mentioned it, that you've got to have your own catheters and wires that you want to use in a given uh, area, and you've got to get used to it. What we normally do is the wire is the one which actually goes and makes a passage, and the catheter supports it. And as you are going through with the wire, you are pushing your catheter over it to negotiate the lesion. Uh, the sheath helps you to support your maneuvering uh, when you're going into this tight uh, calcified territory. Again, uh, I think Keith mentioned it, the angels of concept is what I uh, uh, follow, and that means you want to uh, uh, revascularize the targeted artery. So if there is a lesion in the uh, great toe and you feel this is coming via the posterior territory, posterior arterial territory, it is important that you try and uh, negotiate the posterior territory first before you make an attempt to go into the anterior. If you can't negotiate the anterior, uh, posterior tibial, that's a time you will take another artery, either, either the peroneal or the anterior territory. The straight line flow is what you want to achieve in these patients. And this step-by-step -step approach, as I've shown it here, the wire going, the catheter support, and you slowly and steadily negotiate the uh, stenotic segment would be the right uh, way to treat these uh, tight uh, uh, stenotic areas. Remember that as an interventional radiologist, to cross this long calcified lesion is much more challenging than your cardiology colleague who has often a stenotic lesion. And if at all there is a CTO, it is often a very short segment. So there's, it's more time consuming, more radiation, and more techniques and tricks that you need to uh, employ while doing these kind of uh, therapies. This is something that I often do in my uh, practice. We use a combination of H1H catheter with a micro catheter, and there I use prograde catheter and the wire. And the loop that it forms is a good loop, which helps you to negotiate this long segment distal vessel. Which, as you can see that there's a shadow of calcium along the whole length of the distal posterior tibial artery. And this loop technique is the one which helps me to negotiate these tight lesions. 
if there is uh, a difficulty with a loop technique which often is a sub uh, 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 tracking the wire you may use a cook cxi device and try and negotiate that territory with uh, uh, with uh, stiff uh, weighted wires which will help you to negotiate these calcified lesions here is uh, uh, crossing the lesion if you want to uh, actually cross the lesion we often use a road map where the patient should not move and there should be no movement of the leg that helps you to negotiate all the na narrowed segment and an occluded segment sometimes i also use a calcified track sign as we call it if there's a calcium especially in a diabetic patients this calcium also helps you to tell you that where is the lumen and you want to be within the central lumen of the calcified track the retrotate puncture so as a tibial punctures as we say in the in the dorsal spedis or the posterior tibial around the ankle joint is another technique that we use to get into these as you can see that this is the calcium that is showing the track i would like to negotiate my wire within the lumen of this track and that again is a good guide for us if you can wire uh, uh, these kind of lesions well you are the king this is what is expected out of a good interventional radiologist you should choose a good wire and a combination of wire and catheter that will help you to go past as i said the coaxial technique with the h1 h catheter i use a prograde this is a two french uh, micro catheter system this is a hydrophilic and the loop helps me to negotiate or go past the stenotic segment often it is a subintimal uh, track that i use if there is a stenosis i use a filter fc wire this is mainly a coronary wire a soft hydrophilic wire nice talkable often you need a 300 cm wire because you need an exchange length wire to go past and uh, uh, put a wire across and then get your balloon over it if it is an occlusion i often use a conquest pro 12 this is again uh, a coronary wire that i use and nowadays you have this cook wires which are also very good you have the v14 and v18 by boston scientific these are also good wires and these weighted wires are often necessary if you have used this coronary 180 cm wires you need an extension wire called the dock wire which you can actually connect uh, outside and that extends the length of the whole wire to help you exchange uh, from an ordinary catheter to a, 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 a balloon catheter of you should keep your wire within the parallel track you should try and keep it within the lumen follow it with the support catheter let the wire cross the entire length of the occlusion you may need multiple wires one wire may not work you should be ready with your second line uh, of wire or even a third line of wire that you would like to use as i said crossing the wire is the biggest challenge that you have you like to be through the lumen i prefer to be through the lumen but if not possible subintimal that is you go along the lateral margin of the plug into the uh, into the intima subintimal plane and then dissect that segment and come in you keep the wire wet for easy exchange remember for all these interventions you should have enough time enough patience you should know how to torque the wire and change it from one wire to another and then change it to a given balloon so all these techniques are absolutely important and believe me as an interventional radiologist believe me we have a lot of patience compared to our cardiology colleagues or a vascular surgeons who do these techniques well to cross these lesions especially if it's a cto you have various techniques we call it the drilling technique that means you dig the wire inside and keep on rotating with the torquer that you have outside we call the two ebos device and you can rotate it and penetrate through the cto segment another thing that you can do is if the wire has gone into a wrong plane you can keep that wire in the plane and take another wire and try and cross the lesion through the lumen or through the through the center of the uh, stenotic segment or an occluded segment this is a penetration technique where you actually push a uh, hard uh, weighted wires into the occluded segment and you can actually make a passage this is the uh, the picture of a loop technique that i wanted to show you and when you make a loop often it would be subintimal plane that you will tracking your wire and finding a passage to cross the lesion the the choice of balloon is very important when you want to do these kind of high uh, and uh, complex procedures these balloons should be low profile and hydrophilic 
these are the wire cath wire balloons now available if it's a small wire that you have used the o14 wire well you have to have a compatible wire a balloon with this that are uh, in the in the in the tibial territories these balloons range from 3.5 to 1.5 millimeters and the lengths ranging from 40 to 220 millimeters the shaft length is often one working length that you have of 150 centimeters and you do have tapered balloons that means at the distal end it will be about two two millimeters and the proximal maybe three millimeters because these wires, uh, these uh, uh, these arches, as you know, taper down. You have the drug eluting balloons. You have the inflation device that you should have always available so that you can get high pressures with them. I often do a prolonged dilatation, and the pressure may vary. So this prolonged dilatation, initially low pressure, and then progressively increasing it is very important. Slow inflation is another trick that I use and often a prolonged dilatation up to three minutes is what I do. Especially with a drug coated balloon, it is important that you have a prolonged dilatations. Coming to my last slide here, nowadays often in the tibial vessel we don't have stents but i was the um, uh, uh, one of the investigator a principal investigator studying this bioresorbable stent manufactured by one of our indian companies this is basically a bioresorbable stent that is now being used in the peripheral and i have done more than 30 cases with uh, uh, more than 85 percent patency one year with these bioresorbable stents so probably this is what is the future that we are looking looking at uh, in the treatment of these tibial vessels uh, that uh, I just discussed. So I'm open to any of your, uh, your questions. If you have, I'm open to that. Okay, so I have a little more, yeah. So post-plasty, again, dual antiplatelet, wound care and footwear is very important that you should manage. We often follow up these patients two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, 12 months and one year. Uh, Doppler and uh, TCPO2 is something which helps us to decide whether the wound is healing or not and avoid any injury to the same area or to the opposite foot because these patients often have bilateral tibial arterial disease. These are all diabetic patients, so we got to be careful. Very important uh, is that right in the beginning, you have to see that these are all patients who have either a rest pain or a wound which is needs uh, revascularization. So that is very important for uh, tibial arterial re uh, revascularization. Since I'm open to that, thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Somashwar. Well, excellent talk um, on tibial interventions and techniques. You know, I think with your talk and those from our British colleagues, it helps to emphasize the uh, the global nature of peripheral vascular disease and uh, and that it's really important for all of our trainees globally within interventional radiology to focus within this arena. I was curious though, uh, and I'm really intrigued by this bioresorbable stent because I'm a little jealous that we really don't have that on the horizon here in the US, but is the uh, proportion of patients that you see with peripheral vascular disease, they tend to be more CLI type patients uh, with the patient cohort or patients you see? Yes, uh, so uh, we all know that India is the diabetic capital of the world. And in diabetes and especially smoking, which is so prevalent here, uh, we often end up getting uh, CLI and uh, they come re relatively late. They just, you know, even the doctors don't refer so early for, you know, uh, any kind of intervention. So invariably we get patients coming in late. And with that, we have all these patients that there are um, bad looking wound and very painful conditions. So uh, and tibial vessel is a very common uh, intervention. In fact, if I look at my practice, I would say I end up doing um, out of every 10 patients, seven are tibial arterial disease. And again, multi vessels, multi uh, multi levels, and you have to open up iliac SFA tibials. And often our challenge is that we have to open up the whole segment at one go. We cannot call them up and say, okay, I've done the uh, the iliac and then I'm going to do the tibials after three days or 10 days. I cannot do that. Cost is a big challenge for us. So keeping all that in mind, uh, we, we are, you know, invariably doing one procedure may take two hours or two and a half hours. Great. Uh, well, I actually think that's a whole separate discussion, maybe for another webinar, uh, multi-segment multi, uh, yes. disease treatment versus uh, uh, single station. Um, thank you so yeah, much. Uh, yes. Do you mind if I quickly ask one question about that uh, stent? Uh, if uh, What is the one-year patency on that bioresorbable stent? 
Okay, so as I said, we've just done the preliminary study just to get the approval uh, in India. It's just about getting uh, manufactured now. So we did 30 cases and we got 85% patency wow. with this stent. It's, it's really, and, and it takes about two years for the stent to get resolved. We all know the Abbott uh, uh, coronary stent did not really take off well, but they have changed the design and the luminal diameter is much more. The strut diameters are much less. If you remember, Abbott was 150, this is 100 microns. So therefore, uh, the, the, the design and the technique is, technology is totally different. So I'm quite hopeful that this stent will really play a good role, especially in those areas where there's a recoil or something and you want to put a stent there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Someshwar. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker's uh, combo team effort, Dr. Madassari and his colleague, uh, Dr. Alianello uh, from Podiatry, will be speaking on post-procedure meds and wound care basics. Thanks, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first off, thanks, uh, Rakesh, for this great effort. Uh, it's really inspiring to see so many trainees globally uh, joining us and hearing all the, the interesting talks we have coming from all parts of the world. And we hope to make this bigger and better and keep this going as we dive into other topics. Uh, thanks to Parag and Sahir for being our, uh, our senior members here. I know you don't want to hear that, but you are. Um, you know, I, I was going to do a a talk when I was arranging the agenda today on a lot of complex stuff, but I thought it might be more beneficial for a lot of our trainees to just get a few background basics on post-procedure management. And actually, uh, I gave up quite a bit of my talk so I can have uh, my podiatry colleague give you guys little wound care basics, which he'll jump to after mine. So I'm just going to make this kind of uh, short and sweet. Um, you know, when it comes to post-procedure, post-intervention management, I think uh, we all get excited about doing that complex two, three-hour case to try to save a wound. To me, limb salvage is the focus of what I do, and you know, every time you get a revascularization, you see that angiographic direct or indirect wound blush, you get really excited and you hope that there's a lot going on, but a lot of people stop there, and I think that's the problem. Uh, doing these difficult cases is, is a great accomplishment. To me, that does not mean much. We do these cases where you have a wound and you're trying to revascularize something and you start with this, you have a focal area, you end up doing some cool techniques, looping it around the pedal arch and we all get excited and you end up with a picture like this. And for me, you have to do more than that. You have to revascularize it, start to finish. You have to show where that wound is and you send that to your referral and then your referral uh, like this gets to see a big blood bath, which to me is a very, very great sign for that patient with procedures. Uh, but the intervention is only the first step in taking care of that patient. That's that's at the minimum what we can do from our toolbox, as Dr. Watts has shown you. But without the clinical management of the patient, I know we're trying to repeat this message, is that you're just a procedure monkey. You're a technician. That is not what we are training. That's not why we have an IR residency out there. Uh, with good patient care and longitudinal management, you're the specialist and you're part of the team. And that's what I hope we all understand as we move forward in training, and it's a global thing, and it's a multidisciplinary thing. Uh, you have to understand the comorbidities that affect your patients, and Dr. Vadagacheri can uh, harp on this all day long, and he, you know, he can teach you everything about it. That's what we need to be doing out there. How do we achieve this, and why does it matter? If you don't know the comorbidities that affect your patient, you can't really be an effective team member, an effective uh, specialist for the care of that patient. It's great to know how to use wires, catheters, stents, but that's something in IR that we do all day long in all parts of the body. We need more impact on managing the patient before, during, and after. Uh, you have to engage the big team. A lot of specialists out there, a lot of meetings have talked about how critical limb ischemia, wound care, it's a, it's a team approach. It's not just one physician. It's, it's the physicians, it's the nutritionists, it's the endocrinologists, wound care specialists. You need to have a, a big team, a big squad that attacks uh, the disease and helps these patients get to the right place after the revascularization or before. Uh, you have to see them in clinic before, you have to see them after, you have to see them for as long as they're alive, as long as you're alive, and then hand it off if you can't. But it's a long-term process. Even if you heal that wound, you need to manage them afterwards. You need to be on top of them as a routine team member. And you need to learn and understand wound care if you're dealing with wounds. Um, Dr. Alianella will be able to kind of teach you some more about that, and as we move forward, we'll get more in depth in it. But if you're seeing and treating wounds, you need to understand what they look like, how to treat them, how to manage them, 
how to assist in wound care. And you shouldn't rely on somebody else to tell you what happened to your wound after you treated that revascularization. It's more important than that. Um, you know, this is from many presentations uh, from JCC and all the AMP meetings. We've seen this. It's a, it's a big global effort of caretakers and everybody's involved and every squad has a different component of these, but you are an integral part of it. Uh, it's not just what you do. In terms of follow-up, everybody has their own treatment and follow-up paradigms. Uh, for me, I try to see my patients within two to four weeks if I've already done a procedure. Um, with non-invasive studies nowadays, if they have toes, we get toe pressures, TBIs. There's new perfusion uh, devices coming out that are in trials that can help you monitor these patients, sometimes even remotely, where just like for the cardiac population, if they're having irregular uh, arrhythmias that the physician can be notified, there's technology out there we're working on. Can we be notified if there's a pressure problem in their toes or perfusion pressures? It might give us early warnings because some of these patients are hard to get to the physician's office. So there's a lot to, to coming up in that system. If they're doing well after the first visit, then I see them either one month or three months, and every three months, as long as we can keep up with them, as long as they're around. Um, I think that's very important because there's a lot of comorbidities you have to help manage. You have to understand the medications and what the other uh, referring colleagues are dealing with for your patients. So that's why it's important. For patients that I only see in clinic and don't intervene on, because as we talked about today, you don't intervene on every patient, but when you see a patient, when that patient comes in and you decide that they don't need an intervention, you're still managing them. You're still seeing them and following them up, and that's very important. And managing their medications, understanding it, uh, you know, understanding all the trials out there for these medications, you know, the COMPASS trial, the Voyager trial, these are all things you should read up on. Be cognizant of, talk to your hematologist, get to know them very well, become a pseudo little expert on hematology. These are things that'll help your patients. Most of my patients after I intervene, for the most part, will get uh, baby aspirin and Plavix uh, many times for lifetime. But a lot of these patients, since I see them in clinic, will already have been started on this before I do my intervention. You, we don't stop these medications when we do the procedure. We want them as fluid as possible to keep our perfusion working. Um, understanding all the medications is very critical, as we talked about, and also sending updates to all the team members. And, you know, I get a lot of outside tertiary referrals and sending them the images, talking to them, telling them, keep in contact with me. I'll be seeing your patient and we'll be we'll be working on this together. That's the most important thing. Um, and since we're going to talk about wound care with Dr. Alianello, I thought I'd ask the panel here, maybe Sahir and, uh, and Prague can help me with this. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, just as a pre, pre uh, a primer to what Dr. Alina was going to talk about, uh, Sahar and Parag, what do you think about this wound? You know, there's arterial wounds, there's venous wounds, and there's mixed wounds. Uh, you see some serous sanguinous here and infected exudate. What do you, what, what would you two say? I, mean, I don't know, Kamal, you thought you think we were like born yesterday. I mean, I I, I made this slide, okay? So um, <laughs> let's let's see what Parag says about this. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, right, no, you, probably, I, you know, thought you were thinking how when Kumar speaks, yeah. That, that's your cl classic pastry, right? Is that a Danish or something? Yeah, fine, you guys know this one, all right. So my point being, think outside the box. Um, you know, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to add Dr. Elianello here um, because Lorenzo can't be the only Italian on this, uh, this global <laughs> podcast. So I thought I wanted a US version of uh, Lorenzo on there. So uh, he's one of the podiatrists I work with, and together we've saved a lot of limbs from uh, uh, having a major amputation. So uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Alianello's talk. Thank you, Kumar. Thanks for the, um, the introduction. You know, it's important. Uh, the relationship between the podiatrist and podiatry and, and IR is important because you can't grow a flower without any water, and I tell that to my patients every day. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, yeah, just put it in presenting mode, yeah. Beautiful. All right. All good? Yep. Beautiful. All right. So this is just going to be a quick guide to some uh, wound care principles and understanding wound types. Uh, unfortunately, this book doesn't exist. Never did. Wish it did, but it doesn't. And neither does this book. Uh, I have a one and a half year old, and it'd be nice if she learned early, but they don't exist. So uh, ultimately, the goal of wound care is understanding what type of wound you're looking at, understanding how to treat it, prevent infection, and ultimately save the limb at all costs. Um, the etiology of the wound and understanding the etiology is the most important part. Uh, there are a ton of different wounds out there. Most of them are mixed. But once you understand the cause of the wound and what you're looking at, uh, treatment becomes pretty easy. But sometimes the difficult part 
is knowing that a wound even exists. So uh, we see a ton of patients in our office that are at risk and they come in at risk because they have a callus or some type of little spot on the bottom of that foot. Uh, and ultimately the spot, once you start shaving it down or debriding it, you see it is, has some pus in it and you debride it a little bit more and there's a hole. And now you have full debridement and you have a full thickness ulceration on an at-risk patient. And now you have to uh, manage it ASAP. Uh, an at-risk patient in our clinic is a patient that fails two exams. And the first exam is probably the most important, especially in the diabetic population. Those are the patients that fail the Semmes-Weinstein monofilament. This takes all of 10 seconds, and you'd be surprised at how many patients have little to no sensation at their toes, at their forefoot, at their heel, or essentially at their entire foot. And these people who lose their protective sensation are at risk because the smallest of callus can develop into an ulceration, and these need to be caught before they become an ulcer. Uh, the second at-risk uh, involved patients are those that, fa or that fail the vascular exam, and these are the patients that you guys uh, know pretty well, but they have non-palpable pulses, but they just don't look right. They have atrophic skin changes, no hair growth, delayed CFT. In the presence of no wounds, it raises our eyebrows and we have to make sure that they have no calluses or pre-ulcerative lesions. But in the setting of an open wound, this is a direct um, referral to our IR colleagues for intervention or at least evaluation. Um, wound types, there are a lot of them, uh, but the most important are these four and we'll talk about them briefly. The diabetic neuropathic ulceration is the most common ulcer that we see in clinics on a daily basis and that I, uh, on a weekly basis, send to Kumar for, for further evaluation. And these are patients who develop ulcers because they have a complete loss of protective sensation and they have no ability to feel that Semmes-Weinstein monofilament. These ulcers form at the bottom of bony prominences of their feet, at the metatarsal heads, at the heel, and usually they consist of deep granular wounds with some sort of associated PAD. The number one treatment for neuropathic ulcers is debridement. Debridement is just removing all the devitalized non-viable tissue because these wounds tend to stay in this inflammatory phase. Now there's stages to wound healing, inflammatory, proliferative, and remodeling. And unfortunately, chronic inflammatory, the chronic inflammatory phase of these diabetic wounds uh, prevents actual healing. So Serial debridements, debridements that I perform weekly or bi-weekly or uh, bi-monthly, excuse me, uh, is the purpose of just removing the bio burden, getting that chronic inflammatory phase out, and just kind of facilitating a healthy granular bleeding wound base. Uh, we do that with a scalpel, curette in the office, or we sometimes use some enzymatic debridement, something called collagenase that helps facilitate uh, getting the wound bed a little bit more bleeding and healthier. Now, from a podiatrist, this is the biggest key to healing any type of neuropathic ulcer and it's offloading and it's pretty simple. Um, I tell my patients this every day, it's not what you put on these wounds that heals them, it's what you essentially take off of them. Uh, and that could be as simple as a surgical shoe, uh, a offloading shoe, a total contact cast, or even just using some type of accommodative foam or felt that the patient can even perform at home. Any possible way that you could take pressure off these ulcers helps them heal uh, the fastest. The second type of wound that we commonly see is an ischemic wound, and these present a little bit different. They're more of a punched out lesion with some type of necrotic eschar, uh, some devitalized tissue, or more commonly a gangrenous toe of some sort. Treatment for these is a little bit different than the neuropathic ulcers. We do not debride these. Our goal at this point is to keep them dry and stable. We do not want uh, them to turn wet or gangrenous or, or infected. So our job is to keep it dry and stable and send them to you guys for intervention. Upon revascularization, once they return, that's when we start to look at it and facilitate the debridement. And once the wound starts to bleed, we'll start to remove some of the necrotic tissue or unfortunately amputate at the appropriate level once perfusion uh, is achieved. But at this point, our job is to keep it dry and stable, prevent infection, send them to you guys for revascularization, and then we take care of the wounds thereafter. Venous leg ulcerations, it's kind of, it's, it's not directly in the realm of PAD, but most of our diabetic population has a mixed uh, venous and arterial disease. And these wounds usually uh, present as like punched out lesions on the medial or lateral side of the ankle. They're extremely painful uh, and uh, they can be quite large and unassuming. The treatment for this is debridement, just as in the neuropathic ulcers. But more importantly, instead of 
offloading since they're on the leg you don't need to offload we need to apply compression and this is something you can do in your office or even recommend and it helps the patients tremendously there's static and dynamic compression an una boot just like a wrap or a, a more dynamic compression four layer dressing even something as simple as compression stockings or even these these compression pumps are imperative in getting the uh the the swelling out of the legs and assist in, in healing these wounds but more importantly on your end we always send the patient's view for vein ablations or even um, intervention in, in form of arterial disease uh, for the mixed uh, disease patients because the, the better uh, the flow is uh, perfused to that area of the foot and leg, the quicker these wounds heal. The worst wound we ever see is a decubitus ulcer. And these usually form at the uh, areas that are susceptible to cutaneous pressure, the posterior heel, the malleoli. Um, and these are bad because there's no fat pad between the skin and the bone. It is essentially skin and bone. Once that eschar forms, uh, the patient's kind of screwed. So our job is not to debride it. We leave it alone. We leave that stable eschar alone because if we take that eschar off, we're exposing bone and uh, unfortunately that patient's going to get a bone infection or an amputation. So our focus or anybody's focus for that matter should be on strictly pressure relief and pressure relief in the form of some type of offloading boot like a prefo boot or even something as simple as a foam suspension boot that just takes pressure off the wounds and helps them heal. So when treating those four types of wounds, debridement, offloading, it's all important, but wound care products are also important. And this is a, a crazy large um, uh, area of discussion and we'll try to make it as simple as possible. There's a ton of wound care dressings out there, but the number one reason to uh, use a wound care dressing is to essentially keep the wound bed moist, to facilitate gas exchange, to uh, prevent infection, and essentially uh, keep the wound healthy. There are, again, like I said, a ton of wound care products, some that are just passive uh, products that are essentially just a cover over the wound, some interactive products that control the microenvironment, but more so on the, on the forefront of technology, there's these bioactive products, these biologics that we're actually able to deliver and stimulate cellular activity on the, uh, the wound bed itself, which is um, uh, becoming more prominent and we're using them more now that insurance, at least in and the United States is starting to cover them and, and we're starting to be able to purchase these. If there's anything you remember from this lecture in terms of dressings, um, the uh, it should be that you should just keep the wound bed moist. If the wound is too dry, you wet it. And if it's too wet, you dry it. If you can stay somewhere in the middle and keep the wound bed moist, it facilitates granulation tissue and the wound will heal with appropriate offloading. There are a ton of different wound care products, like I said, all which you can look up that will um, facilitate the moist wound bed itself. Uh, bioactives, like the biologics, like I was talking about, on the forefront technology are these more amniotic cell membrane graphs, which we're able to apply in the operating room and sometimes even in the office. And they provide cellular activity to the wounds and are healing the wounds at a very, very fast rate. Um, there was a clinical consensus uh, study done in 2010. And essentially what it looked at was the rate of healing and when we should kind of initiate the use of biologics. And what they found was that if a wound does not heal uh, by 50% at four weeks, the chance of it healing by 12 weeks is only 9%. So essentially what they're saying is that at four weeks, if the wound or if any wound hasn't healed by four, by 50% with your standard debridement and offloading techniques, it's time to bring out the big guns. You should think about using these more biologic wound care products. And in this picture, you see that we used a um, amniotic wound graft that we applied in the operating room. Um, and this, this patient healed about uh, four to six weeks after using that product. So the important thing about being a podiatrist is knowing when, in th when to throw in the towel. And that's when we encounter bone infection. Rather than thinking of amputation as destructive, we need to understand that it is actually a constructive process. Um, if you ever see a wound that probes the bone, you have to understand that it has an 89% positive predictive value for bone infection. And if someone has bone infection, that ultimately needs that Devitalized bone needs to be removed, or uh, unfortunately, that patient needs an amputation. Now, on my end uh, and our end, as as my colleagues, we need to prevent below the knee amputations and somehow get the amputation to a, a functional limb, and that would be in the form of either a digital amputation or a transmetatarsal amputation. Uh, and that amputation needs to have an available uh, viable flap, good blood flow, and needs to be able to fit into an adequate prosthetic to allow the patient to ambulate. Uh, we all know how bad the statistics are uh, once someone gets a below the knee amputation. 
uh, and the morbidity and mortality rates are even far, are far worse when the uh, patients who are diabetic and peripheral vascular disease get a below the knee amputation. So as a, a foot and ankle surgeon and a podiatrist, my job is to prevent that below the knee amputation and allow for a functional amputation and that of a transmetatarsal amputation. There are many times when I've done two or three or four revisional transmetatarsal amputations and called Kumar to ask him to look at the leg again and uh, revascularize the leg again because we have uh, we do not uh, settle for below the knee amputations. And uh, our working relationship is great because on many settings, this is one of his patients. Um, we've went back three or four times, but we always uh, uh, our goal is always to save the limb and prevent the BKA. So from a podiatrist standpoint and a wound care specialist, uh, I just want to thank our IR colleagues uh, who uh, who want to practice limb salvage. Thank you, um, thank you for that team from Rush. This was uh, this was amazing collaboration. Um, thanks a lot, Nick. This was a, a one of the best uh, talks from uh, on wound care from podiatry I've, I've actually heard. Um, very well done, and uh, thanks Kumar for showing up and uh, bringing Nick along. <laughs> I, I, I would like to say I'm kind of upset that he didn't use the accent that Lorenzo did, so we'll have to let him go with that. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, um, no, I think this was great. I mean, I think we'll, we'll share the slides and I'll probably go through them uh, one more time. Um, there's a lot to learn for us um, about wound care management. Uh, just a quick question to you, um, Nick, about uh, when do you decide to send a patient with what you think is an ischemic wound for revascularization? If it's a small wound, would you just go and see if the debridement and then conservative management is enough? Um, and when, once you're cut off, do you use certain you know, vascular studies or a clinical exam? What do you decide to send them to to Kumar and the other uh, IR team? That's a great question. Um, I think my working relationship with Kumar is so good that as soon as I, uh, uh, even if I can palpate the pulses in the office and the patient already has a wound, um, I get the vascular studies, the non-invasive studies ordered, and then give them a direct referral to the Rush IR team. Um, I I leave it up to Kumar just to to tell me if he thinks that the patient should come in at least for an angio. And if, if for me, if the patient already has a wound and is diabetic or uh, is already ulcerating, it is the absolute right time to send them to uh, to you guys to just take a look. Even just even if he looks and there's no intervention needed, it 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 makes me feel better because we know that we've tried every, everything before progressing to some type of amputation. And Kumar, any comment on that? How often does that happen? You you get a when you say no, this is patient doesn't have what's what criteria do you, yeah. do you to intervene? Yeah, I mean, I think the good thing is that having a good relationship with whoever your referrals are, you develop an understanding. And, you know, for Nick, it's been great because he knows all the ischemic signs and, you know, the, the your kind of your spidey sense kicks in fast. And I'd say of the ones that, you know, he, he sends for referral, I'd say 80, 90 percent of them need some kind of intervention. There's, But you have to know, and we talked about this in this presentation many times, when not to intervene is more important than, you know, just intervening. At the end of the day, also, an angiogram to prove that you have direct flow, there's nothing wrong with it in safe hands if you feel it's appropriate. So it's a little different than the Claudicant, you know, early rest pain people that we're talking about. We're talking about patients that you're not looking for a five-year outcome of what you do. You're looking for that wound to close. And to me, if you can prove it and, you know, Nick and our other friends can feel confident that they're doing the best they can, it's been a great, it's been a great relationship. And I think that's what we need to focus on. That's excellent, uh, excellent points. And you know, there's you know a lot of talk about you know small wounds with uh, with not a lot of great signs of ischemia to watch it. Where you know, and there's several classification for it, and Wi-Fi is one of them, and several others um, that we can you know dive deep into in next uh, next sessions. But this was great. Thanks a lot for the team. Next, uh, we'll go to uh, Georgia Fadik, Medic and Cherry um, from LA. Talk to us about um, the PAD clinic, a point he's very very passionate about. Georgia, take us home. Uh, unmute, um, unmute yourself, Georgie. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, for the kind introduction. And yeah, it is certainly something I'm very passionate about, just clinic in general, but PAD clinic. And the question I ask is, what would Daughter and Barry Katzen do? All right, and that's kind of what I'm gonna kind of reflect. So I think there's been international uh, cross collaboration from the dawn of when we started this, as well as kind of interspecialty collaboration. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Sven Iver Seldinger from Europe really developed the percutaneous approach to accessing a vessel. And Charles' daughter, as Keith Pereira uh, showcased, saved Laura Shaw's leg um, uh, two years uh, in 1964, on January 16th. He worked with Melvin Judkins, who learned from Mason Stone's how to do coronary angiography. And this triumvirate of daughter, who taught Zeeler from Europe, 
who is an interventional radiologist who really took it on and really expanded its role in Europe. And then Andres Grunzik, also from Europe, was an angiologist who kind of learned from these two uh, gentlemen and really expanded the role into the coronary space. But really the father, I, in my opinion, of kind of clinical interventional medicine is Barry uh, Katzen um, from the Miami Cardiac Vascular Institute who trained uh, the Parag Patel. And how do you start this clinic? I think, number one, you have to share both uh, Charles' daughter and Barry Katzen's vision and mission for clinic and have a passion for limb salvage. And the cornerstone of clinic is really this, in my opinion, is really truly to establish a relationship with the patient, engender their trust, and ultimately you're gonna treat them like family because you know them as an individual. You know who they are, what their prior jobs were, are they married, divorced, how many kids and grandkids they have, um, what are their hobbies, et cetera, who they are, okay? And then you do examine them, as Lorenzo has said, you do that quality popliteal pedal femoral uh, you know, pulse exam, you quantify and qualify the wound as was um, very elegantly described by uh, Nick. Um, and you do your own ultrasound assessment. I think this is another valuable tool. Take the ultrasound and do your own ultrasound evaluation of the femoral popliteal, tibial, the waveform of the confemoral while you're in the clinic. And the patients appreciate that and gives you kind of a roadmap. It is really important to risk to identify these patients. These patients die of heart attacks and strokes. So it's very important that you do a good thorough cardiovascular and pulmonary exam and look at the renal function. So uh, EGFR gives you the kidney uh, disease and I stratify based on CKD. I look at to see if they're on home oxygen, then they're pretty sick or if they're on COPD on inhalers. Um, and then I look at the echo or look at their functional status, i.e. how many METs can they do? How many stairs can they climb? How far can they walk and how much time? What's their frailty index? What's their grip strength when they shake your hand pre-COVID era? And or how fast they get out of the chair and walk to the door? And also, most of these patients are diabetic, so it's very important to assess their A1C. And also, because they uh, ultimately suffer from the complications of retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy, it's important to look at their microalbumin, do that loss of protective sensation that uh, Dr. Eliano had talked about, and a visual checks. Um, these patients are, again, very high risk for heart attacks and strokes and vascular events, so really important to control their LDL. And as Lorenzo had talked about, Dr. Patrona talked about smoking cessation and varenicline is a very powerful drug, but really you need to have this discussion with the patient every time. Now, I'm not going to go into all this medical management. I think uh, Kumar and others have talked about it, but this is a talk that we had given from the SIR standpoint in 2019. It's on the web, and here's a YouTube link that you can assess. And it really goes over some of the statins, the latest and greatest in PCSK9 inhibitors, um, SGLT2 inhibitors, and GLP-1 analogs that are being more progressively used in the diabetic population, and even the discussion that you've had about rivaroxaban with the Compass and now the most recent Voyager. Now, it is really important to use non-invasive uh, physiologic uh, testing beyond your pulse exam, and then as appropriate anatomic imaging, whether it be MRA, CTA, uh, but you have to be stewards of the resources, as uh, was discussed in the our ISVR president's talk, in the UK discussions, there is limited resources uh, globally, so we have to be good stewards of what we utilize. Um, but I do have a low threshold if the wound is not healing and there's a, a suspicion of arterial insufficiency to do the angiogram with potential revascularization. When you see them in the clinic and there's signs of infection, you need to send to the ER with a plan on admission and deep tissue biopsies and antibiotics, et cetera. So this is a glowing global pandemic of diabetes and obesity. We as a society of healthcare professionals must and can do better. We have to, have to educate our colleagues on what we can offer, whether it be diabetologists, wound care nurses, physicians, primary care physicians, and the public at large about amputation prevention. And we need to develop a network of passionate physicians similar to what is on this panel, including Dr. Uh, Nick, who is our uh, a passionate podiatrist about diabetic foot care, um, nurses, administrators who want to limit amputation. And I think that's really key. And have them on speed dial and talk to them frequently. Now, if you look at this, in 1994, it was around a 5% or less kind of incidence of diabetes in the US. Look at 20, 30 years later, it's, it's in the double digits. So we have a pandemic of diabetes and it's not just the US. This is, uh, affects the entire world and it's progressing. The kind of industrialization or westernization of diets and the lack of exercise has impacted the, the, the whole global society. And again, obesity is the cornerstone. Diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease, arthritis, um, et cetera, and even cirrhosis with NAFLD and NASH. So we can do much better. Now, it's interesting that he brought up this, uh, uh, this test with loss of protective sensation. 
It's a very simple test. And my own uh, ESIR resident, IR resident, Matthew Zartan, who's a PGY-5, figured out a way to take fish wire very cheaply and cut it to a certain length and use it as a 10-gram monofilament. Now, we, uh, Dr. Pereira talked about the Wi-Fi score, but basically what that is is how bad is the wound, how bad is the infection, and how bad is the circulation, including arterial, venous, and lymphatic. The combination of those things need to be addressed. Circulation, when you're looking at critical limb ischemia, the pulse exam may not be enough, ABI may be inaccurate. Really, you have to get down to the skin or the toes, and that resolves with toe pressure transcutaneous pressure of oxygen or skin perfusion pressures. So whatever your lab uses, you probably need something like this to, to guide you and assist you in determining the viability and the likelihood of healing from a circulation standpoint. Now, this is from Dr. Sava Lim from uh, Twitter, but I, I thought it was very elegant and very true. We are not in the artery opening business. We're in the wound closing business. And that includes a deeper understanding of of the, what are our options for patients, whether it be orthotics, scooters, wheelchairs. Nutrition's important. You can't heal without adequate nutrition. We have to educate not only the patient, but their family and their social network on the wound and how to dress it, how to look at it, what to worry about. Frequent and often clinic visits, and again, establishing good communication with all the physicians and nurses and your podiatry colleagues that are involved in the care of this patient. And it does take a village, a global village. And it truly is, in this situation, true. The teamwork makes the dream work. And so this is the Limb Savage team that many have showed, vascular specialists, uh, podiatrists, orthotics, home health, ID, wound care team, diabetologists, primary care. And these are things that you need to get more familiar with, uh, some of the brilliant offloading capacity that we could do. Now, there is a, you know, turmoil occurring right now in the US as we speak. Um, uh, because of some recent events in the Minnesota. Um, and this is an interesting uh, uh, slide which shows, if you look at historically in the U.S., where the kind of the enslaved population in the 1860s, kind of, kind of south of the Mason-Dixon line, that actually reflects the amputation rates also. So we should pay heed to this. And they're the underserved, vulnerable population is at high risk for this process. And there are many human rights leaders, whether it be Mohandas Karamachand Gandhi from India or Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who were involved in kind of nonviolent approaches to resolving some of these issues, and we should pay heed to that. So this is the pandemic, and even after closure of the wound, our job is not done. It needs to, we need to prevent wound recurrence, and there's a concept of what I call wound remission. And it's kind of like cancer remission. Our goal is to prolong the number of days of good limb function without a wound. So I'm very blessed to have some very talented, but really more importantly, very compassionate, passionate residents who are not only COVID bars, two of my integrated residents, PGY5s, volunteered. They weren't retargeted. They volunteered to go to the, the worst uh, area of COVID uh, crisis in the ICU. Um, they're also passionate CLI fighters. And this Ben and Adi quote, again, reflects kind of our time that we live in with the COVID. This is a once in a century event. How you respond to the crisis, your attitude, your willingness to help, and your compassion, most importantly for others, will define who you are for the rest of your life, both professionally and personally. Now is the time to rise to the occasion and lead by example. So that not only leads to COVID, but also diabetic management, obesity education, and really limb preservation. And these are, this is just yesterday morning. This is Karthik Kansagra and Zar Tan, both COVID fighters and warriors, but also CLI fighters doing some uh, morning debridement with my PGY-1 uh, Zyambilla uh, yesterday morning. And you can see kind of that fibrinous fluff inflammatory component, kind of cleaning it out to get some debridement. And we work very collaboratively with our podiatrists who are amazing at really salvaging these very god-awful wounds. And I, and I pay credit to them, and we need more podiatrists to really push this message on envelope. So in conclusion, this is a highly prevalent disease. And as a medical student or resident trainee, whether you're here in the US, UK, India, it is critical that you can get involved to save limbs and lives in this vulnerable and underserved population. We need to develop a solid foundation disease as you've heard before, diabetic management, wound care, lower extremity non-invasive evaluations and understanding the angiogram, but we all must do better. And it really starts with this global initiative, change our dietary patterns, increase exercise in the youth, and failure is really not an option. And I leave you with this. Patients fight hard, and we as uh, vascular interventionalists and podiatrists and others need to train and fight harder. Thank you. That was 
Fantastic. Uh, I think the message has been spread across uh, and I hope all of us have been uh, awoken from the sleep that the interventionalist can treat and should treat uh, the PAD uh, patients. With that being said, I would like to thank everyone who's here. We appreciate you being here. Our next webinar will be the continuation of today's topics and will be announced shortly on our social media platforms. Please be on the lookout. And I want to sincerely thank all the faculty members for educating us about an extremely important topic and helping raise awareness about the peripheral arterial disease and critical limb ischemia. Lastly, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to join us. We will be looking forward for your association again. And with that note, we are going to end the webinar and hope everyone has a wonderful day ahead. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Rocket. Thank you. Thanks. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks, Rakesh. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Great work. Thank you.